Hello and welcome. In this video, I will be presenting Pyrrell's findings for the Ising model. Now, a caveat before I get started, I do assume some amount of statistical mechanics knowledge. I also use a small amount of combinatorics. I first want us to recall that each lattice site on our 2D lattice is assigned a spin value, i.e. each sigma i is assigned plus one for an upspin or minus one for a downspin, where i ranges from one to n, n being the total number of spins on our lattice. The energy is the Hamiltonian. Now the Hamiltonian consists of two sums, one being the sum over nearest neighbor bond interactions, where E is their interaction value, and the sum over the whole lattice of the interactions of each spin with the external magnetic field. We will be looking at the idea of spontaneous magnetization. At a low enough T, there is a non-negligible tendency for a spin to stay in the up position after an up magnetic field has been imposed and then removed. This video will be a presentation of Pyrrell's argument from 1936, which states that there is a phase transition guaranteed at some temperature in 2D. Our setup is the flat model where we have a boundary and we will set all of the boundary spins to be up. When we let the boundary move off to infinity, i.e. n approaches infinity, which we call the thermodynamic limit, that is the equivalent to having the magnetic field disappear. For some spin deep inside the lattice, some sigma naught, we would expect the probability that it is a downspin to be one half if there is no magnetic field. However, if the temperature is low enough and we therefore have spontaneous magnetization, the probability that sigma naught is down becomes less than one half by an amount independent of the lattice size. And that is what we shall now prove. We start by defining omega to be the set of all configurations with a positive boundary. And sigma is a set of a configuration of spins. The probability for a given configuration is then e to the negative beta h over z, where beta is 1 over kt, h is the Hamiltonian, and z is the partition function, which is the sum over all configurations of e to the negative beta h. Consider some sigma naught corresponding to a point in the interior of the lattice. We want to calculate for that sigma naught the probability that it is a down spin, which will be 1 over z times the sum over all configurations in omega naught of e to the negative beta h, where omega naught, which is contained in omega, is a set of configurations where sigma naught is negative 1. Now here's a simple 3 by 3 example. We have a positive ocean a negative island, and a shoreline that divides the two. Now a shoreline is a closed path of line segments connecting the midpoint of adjacent squares. Each segment of shoreline separates the positive ocean from the negative land. That is, for a given shoreline, we have a set of nearest neighbor bonds such that their product is negative one. So we have a shoreline S around sigma naught with a length of n of s. Our set of configurations with s as a shoreline we call omega s, which is contained in omega naught. The probability for omega s is 1 over z times the sum over all configurations in omega s of e to the negative beta h. Now we can split the summand into two pieces, where the first term is the shoreline piece and the second term is everything else. Now, because the shoreline piece does not depend on the bounds of the summation, we can pull it out. From there, we want to create a mapping. For a given sigma in omega s, we can form 
sigma prime by changing all signs inside our shoreline S. So in this example, we change the singular sign inside the shoreline to a positive sign. For a fixed shoreline, sigma to sigma prime is one to one. Omega S prime is the image of omega S for this mapping. Note that the sum over all nearest neighbor bonds not in S is precisely the sum of all nearest neighbor bonds in our prime mapping minus the length of the shoreline. And if you don't believe me, feel free to pause the video and check the math for yourself. So from our probability calculation we previously found, we can replace the nearest neighbor bond summation for nearest neighbors not in S with our prime mapping. But this term here, E times the summation over prime nearest neighbor bonds is precisely the Hamiltonian for our prime mapping. Because E to the negative beta H is greater than zero for all configurations, we can replace the sum over omega S prime with a sum over all configurations. But one over Z is precisely one over the sum of all configurations. So those two terms cancel, and we have that the probability for omega S is less than e to the negative beta e n of s. We now want to consider all shorelines in the set s which surround sigma naught. So we sum over all of those probabilities and using what we just derived, we replace the probability of omega s with e to the negative beta e n of s. We can then rewrite this as the sum from n equals 4 to infinity of s of n times e to the negative beta e n, where s of n is the number of shorelines with length n surrounding sigma naught. Now the sum starts at the shortest shoreline length, which is 4. Our next task is to bound s of n. If our shoreline around sigma naught is a length n, it must be contained within a square with sides of length n over root 2, because n is the length of the diagonal of the square. We know that s of n is less than 1 over r of n, where r of n is the number of random walks length n originating in the square. The factor of 1 over n comes from ordering. Each point in the random walk can be considered the point of origin. There are n over root 2 squared starting points and 4 to the n possible paths. So s of n is less than 1 half times n times 4 to the n. Going back to our probability calculation, we can now replace s of n with this term that we now know to be larger. We can then do a little bit of rearranging and then expand the sum to start at 1. And we get that the probability that sigma naught is negative 1 is less than 1 half times the sum from 1 to infinity of n times 4 times e to the negative beta e all to the n. But because this is an infinite sum, it doesn't tell us very much. So now we're going to look at the identity for a geometric series, which states that for the absolute value of x less than 1, the sum of that geometric series is 1 over 1 minus x. If we take this equation, differentiate, and then multiply by x, we get an infinite sum in the same form as we have in our probability. We can then let x be 4 times e to the negative beta e, and we get a final result, which states that the probability that sigma naught is a downspin is less than 1 half times 4 times e to the negative beta e over 1 minus 4e to the negative beta e quantity squared.
Now this result only holds in the mathematical case where four times e to the negative beta e, the absolute value of that is less than one, which implies that beta is large or we have a very low temperature. So in this case, beta is large enough that we can make the probability arbitrarily small. And we therefore have spontaneous magnetization. I now move to an estimation of that critical temperature that we just proved existed. In 1936, Pyrrels, with the help of Beta, counted the number of spins that could be enclosed with information from the partition function to find a critical temperature bound. But as an adaptation of that argument, I shall trace a random path in the dual lattice and use energy arguments. Now it is important to note that the square lattice is self-dual and therefore these two pictures will in fact look the same. I start with the lowest energy state which is all spins aligned and this is a trivial interaction picture. I show it here for a five by five lattice. If we have an island of anti-aligned spins we must have an increase in energy of 2En. Now, the 2E comes from the fact that we are flipping a spin and the energy to flip is E minus a negative E or 2E. And that is times the number of flipped spins, which are the boundary spins, precisely the length of the shoreline. It is important to note that the dependence is on N, the length of the shoreline, or the domain wall, and not the number of spins enclosed. So in this simple five by five example, even though the image on the right has one more spin enclosed, it is the energy equivalent of the picture on the left. The boundary of length n is an n-stepped closed path. A choice of two directions at each spin site is enough to guarantee a closed path. And thus, there are two to the n closed paths of length n. So we can calculate the change in entropy, which will be ln of two to the n. We can then calculate the change in free energy, combining the previous two equations, which we find to be n times 2e minus t ln two. At low temperature, where we have spontaneous magnetization or ferromagnetic behavior, we can assume stable boundaries. Thus, delta F is less than or equal to zero. Approaching from below, we can obtain an approximation of the critical temperature, which will be two over ln two times E, or 2.885 E. Now I've just shown these two arguments for two dimensions only. However, similar thought processes can be used to get the results for 3D. Thanks for watching.